welcome to the Ridgeline Family Christmas. The best looking house in town, Russ. Welcome to the show! How many love Christmas? How many love Christmas? Like, I, I love Christmas. Uh, I think it is Christmas time is the best time of year. It is my favorite time of year. I've loved it since I was a kid. My parents made a big deal about Christmas. In fact, if given the choice between uh, 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 Christmas and my birthday, I, I would choose Christmas every time. Like, I like my birthday, and, and, but, you know, when you get to this age, when you get to, you know, the age of some of y'all, uh, the birthdays just are, birthdays are just a little bit, they're just not as, like, significant, or you're going like, ah, oh, you almost learn to dread them as you, you age or you get older, but, man, I love Christmas. And now, here, here's the deal. I wish that as, as a pastor, I could tell you that the reason that I love Christmas is, you know, the reason for the season, it's Jesus, it's, it's all of those things, that, and um, it's not. <laughs> I, I love gifts, all right? I, I love gifts. They're, they're my favorite thing. I don't know if, like, gifts are my, uh, are my love language. They're certainly not when it comes to, like, my wife, but I love getting things that I, that I like. I love, I love getting, receiving gifts, and it's fun. I, I love the holidays, but for more important reasons, too, I do, I do love, you know, hanging out with good friends and family and, and uh, gifts and food and uh, the lights and the excitement, the atmosphere, uh, gifts. I like those. Uh, holiday fun is a great reason to love Christmas. Just, you know, enjoying the magic of Christmas. Of course, gifts are always good. The, the hustle and bustle, I'm one of those people that uh, uh, I used to work at the mall like years ago when uh, uh, I was in a different type of ministry, but I, I had to have a second job. And so I worked at the mall over like a Christmas season. And uh, I loved the hustle and bustle of, you know, just watching people and, and husbands who waited till Christmas Eve to do their last minute shopping. And like all, of, I loved it. Of course, I, I love gifts. And, and but the, just like, I love the whole season. I loved coming together uh, uh, for Christmas as a church family, which I'm excited to announce we're going to be doing uh, Saturday, to, excuse me, Sunday, December 22nd. Uh, right here at 5 p.m. will be our Christmas service. We will not have a Sunday morning service uh, that Sunday. We'll just have our Christmas service that Sunday evening at 5 p.m. and uh, a couple of days before Christmas. And so uh, a great opportunity to invite friends and family, especially friends and family who don't know Jesus. I'll specifically be doing a gospel message uh, um, and, and talking about uh, you know, obviously Jesus, right? Uh, but but that's um, that's going to be an amazing service. The, the worship team's been working on some of that stuff, and it, it's going to be a great time. It'll be a little bit more condensed service. We, we'll be a 58-minute service, so it'll be, you know, under an hour, so it doesn't take a ton of time from family and, and whatever on holiday, uh, you know, on your holiday season. But it's a great opportunity for your, for your um, uh, friends and family to, to come with you to church and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. My name's Nathan. I'm the... Um, the lead pastor here at Ridgeline Church, and so excited to be with you, especially um, after being off uh, uh, communicating over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had charity in last week, and then last, or a couple of weeks ago, and then over the holidays, Steve, Steve spoke, and, and so that was absolutely amazing. We finished up our Beyond series. If you missed any part of that series, you can get caught up uh, on our website or on our central hub. So uh, today we're launching this brand new series, and I'm really excited about Light Has Light has come. And when it comes to Christmas, I have to let you in on a big secret. 
about Christmas that I, I hesitate to tell you um, because I, I feel like, you know, if you don't, if, it might rock some of you, this secret about Christmas that I'm going to share with you. I don't want it to damage your faith or, you know, your Christmas reality. Um, and so if after you hear this, uh, if after you hear this um, secret or whatever about Christmas, uh, if, you know, you might need some prayer after service, whatever, feel free to come. And Crystal and I, my wife and I, will pray for you, and, and it'll be, I promise, we will walk you through this uh, big announcement. But here it is. Some of you may want to plug your ears to live in blissful ignorance, but, uh, all right, you re- everybody ready? All right. Jesus was not born on December 25th. Uh, I know. I know. A lot of us grew up thinking this, right? Jesus was born on December uh, 25th. But here's the deal. Most likely he was born uh, uh, around the end of September, you know, uh, uh, late fall or, or early fall, I guess. Uh, late, he was born late September, early fall in the Hebrew month of, which I can't pronounce very well, but it's uh, Tishri, Tishri or something along those lines. Uh, but the Hebrew month of Tishri, which would be about, and, and the reason why we know this is because the Bible doesn't give any, you know, we, the Bible doesn't give a specific date about Jesus' birth. Uh, however, the dates can be estimated based on Hebrew shepherds historically tending flocks at night. If, you, if you've seen uh, uh, Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown, you know he quotes the King James, Luke chapter 2, um, and the shepherds were in their fields keeping watch over their flocks at night, right? And so based on what we know about when the time of year that shepherds would tend their flocks at night and based on what we know about the birth of both uh, John the Baptist and, and the prophecies and, and the angel visitation, all of that for, for both Mary and Elizabeth, Mary being Jesus' mom, Elizabeth uh, being John the Baptist's mom, uh, we, we estimate it's somewhere late September. All right, everybody Okay. All right, I didn't ruin anybody's Christmas. All right. But the reason why I love this this time of year, because I love we get to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Not even though it maybe technically happened a different time of year. But I feel like there's something special about, about not just as, you know, a local church or a community of churches or, or the church as a nation or as a whole around the world, but just, just there seems to be this type of hope this time of year unlike any other time of year. There seems to be, there's, there seems to be, like people seem to be uh, a little bit nicer to each other this time of year for the most part, except for when you're in a Target parking lot and you intentionally go real slow because the guy behind you is riding your bumper and then you just, for no reason, choose to stop for every pedestrian, even though he seems to be in a big hurry, and then he gets out of your, his car and comes up to knock on your window to scream and yell at you. Now, other than like, you know, specific instances like that, people are generally nicer to each other this time of year. This time of year seems to offer hope. That really happened to me in the Target parking lot. This guy was in a big hurry, and so I was just, you know, going an appropriate speed limit, and then he got real close to me, so now I'm like, all right, it's on, man. So I stopped for every pedestrian, every single pedestrian, like busy a couple days before Christmas. There were people coming on the Target left and right. I stopped for all of them. Didn't need to stop, but I needed to stop, you know, like it was one of those scenarios. He gets out of his car, and he comes, and he knocks on my window, and he just starts yelling at me and screaming and berating me, but the best part was is all the other cars, you know, because there's cars coming from every direction in the parking lot, you could see all the other cars kind of like roll down their window just a little bit and lean in to hear. (laughs) What did I do? I smiled and waved. Yeah, I really did. I I must have been having a good day because that's not always my reaction in those types of situations, if we're being honest, you know. Sometimes I would get out of the car, okay? (laughs) I did it that day. It was Christmas, you know? (laughs) So, but there's this great analogy that we often use for hope. There's this great analogy that we often use. Maybe you've used it. You've probably said it. And it is this this idea of light. That that light is... uh, 
is, uh, is, is this thing of hope or this analogy of hope or, or, or maybe the opposite. Maybe you're in a, a, a challenging season where it seems like there's no hope and, and maybe it feels dark. Maybe you've said things uh, uh, along the line of, you know, I just came out of a real dark season or, or I just, you know, I just, uh, there, but luckily there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And we use this analogy of, of, of light or the absence of light referring to hope or the absence of hope. Maybe you had a revelation one day and you said, I, and then I saw the light, right? You came to this understanding that you didn't previously have. But maybe you're here this morning and you're, you've been in a, what you consider to be a dark season. Maybe because of some health issues that you've been struggling with. Maybe because of your family. You know that Christmas is coming and inevitably you've got to spend time with people that maybe weren't the easiest people to be around. Maybe this is the first Christmas or you know, your few Christmases in to a divorce. And this Christmas is going to look a little bit different than the way that they used to look. Maybe you've got to figure out arrangements with kids and the house will just feel a little more empty this time of year. Maybe you're dealing with a loss. This will be the first Christmas without your mom or the first Christmas without your dad or the first Christmas without some significant person in your life. Maybe it feels like a dark season just because your work schedule through this holiday season. It just feels like you got to work and work and work and work, and you never catch up. You never catch a break. You never get to really enjoy the holiday season. What I find out I love about this analogy of light being hope or darkness kind of feeling like the absence of hope is that, that it, it's not a new analogy. This isn't a new analogy. In fact, we find this analogy all throughout Scripture. We find it all throughout Scripture. Uh, we find it, we see it in... Um, in Psalms 107, in verse 10, it says that those who dwell in darkness dwell in the shadows of death. They're prisoners of mercy and chains because, uh, misery, excuse me, they're prisoners of misery and their chains and, uh, because they've rebelled against God. There's this analogy of, of darkness when there's separation from God. In John chapter 3, 19, uh, uh, John says that people who do, uh, who do evil deeds love the darkness. In John chapter 8, John uses this analogy again. Jesus says, actually he's, he's quoting Jesus. He's, Jesus says, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. In Ephesians chapter 5, there's this whole section in, the cha in this chapter uh, about what it means to walk in the light. What it looks like to walk in the light. And we, this is Paul writing Ephesians, he says, we, those who are in Christ, were once in darkness before knowing Christ. We were once in darkness before knowing Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, Jesus uh, rescues us out of darkness, Paul writes. Jesus rescues us out of darkness. And so there's this analogy in Scripture that talks about our, our life before knowing Jesus being a life full of darkness. And then our life post knowing Jesus or, or meeting Jesus is, is a life where, where God rescues us, where Jesus rescues us out of darkness and brings us into the light. The hope of Christmas and what we celebrate is stated, I believe, for the first time that I know of in, in Scripture. This way as the light, the hope of Christmas being stated as light is, is stated for the first time in Isaiah chapter 60. This is approximately 500 years before Jesus even is, comes onto the scene, but the, the, the prophet Isaiah uh, uh, is, is, is prophesying about what, what, who Jesus is and what's going to happen, and, and he sees some amazing stuff, and the, the, the word Isaiah, the, 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 which was the name of the prophetic uh, uh, writer, prophetic uh, visionary over Israel at this time, the word Isaiah means the Lord's salvation. So Isaiah, even his name being a prophetic statement that Jesus is coming. 
We also see the themes throughout the book of Isaiah of the, uh, the holiness of God and the Holy One of, or the Holy One of Israel, that God is a holy God, but we also see uh, the, the, the humility before God. We see those things. And towards the end of the book of Isaiah, there's this prophecy that Isaiah speaks over Israel. Now, I, I was doing some research on this portion of scripture earlier in the week, and there, there's a lot of controversy about exactly what or whom Isaiah is speaking to. There's a lot of controversy. If, if, and so what we, what we do know for sure is like Isaiah went forward in time, and, and he's looking back over history, and he's speaking to, and here's where the controversy comes in, he's either speaking to the church, or he's speaking to uh, uh, the New Jerusalem, or, or Zion, or, or the Israel nation, or whatever, and I think that for us, all of those things are intertwined, and, and if he's speaking to one group, it's, it's okay to claim it for the other group because, you know, as, as uh, there is a time in history will, where Israel will, will be ingrained back into the church, and, and of course, Scripture teaches that we were grafted in to, to Israel uh, uh, as believers, and so everything that, that is for them scripturally is also for us as the church, and so I, I think that for the most part, uh, with the controversy, it doesn't matter. Here's what, here's what Isaiah says as far as how it applies to us it doesn't matter here's what he says Isaiah chapter 60 starting in verse 1 he says arise 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 it's time to get up from, from maybe a spiritual, uh, spiritual depression uh, or a spiritual slumber or a spiritual sleep it's time to wake up it's time to arise to a new way of living. It's time to get up. And he says, arise and shine. Arise and shine. And not, arise and be radiant with the glory of the brilliance of the Lord. It's time to wake up, church. It's time to wake up, Israel, and to begin to be radiant with the glory and the brilliance of the Father. Arise, shine. And continues, for your light has come. And regardless of your theology on who exactly this is speaking to and what exactly this is speaking about, we all can agree that the light that's referenced here is Jesus. Arise, shine, church. Arise, shine. Israel, arise, shine, New Jerusalem, for, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. The glory or, or the brilliance of the Father rises upon you. I love this. There's this theme of brilliance. There's this theme of light all throughout Scripture revolving around the person of Jesus. Remember when the, when the angels were giving the message to the shepherds like we talked about a few minutes ago? And the angels... They showed up to the shepherds, and, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, right? What is it? Uh, is it Charlie Brown who, who quotes the scripture? And they were sore afraid. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. He continues, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. So there's this contrast. There's this contrast between what's going on here. We have the people of God, illuminated by the glory of God, celebrating that the light has come, that Jesus has come. And then we have this contrast between those who, who don't know the Lord, those who, who are, uh, um, those who are you know, kind of ignorant to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, ignorant to what has happened, ignorant to the goodness of the Father, ignorant to all of these things, and they live in darkness. There's this other great portion of Scripture in, in Luke chapter 1, and this is uh, the back half of a prophetic song that um, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, begins to sing upon the birth of his son. 
And so in Luke chapter 1, here's, here's what we see. This is the back. This is, he's already been singing for several verses. And, and then he's singing. He's singing this over his son after he's been born, John the Baptist. And he says, and you, my child, will be called a, pro- the, a prophet of the Most High. This is John the Baptist who will be a prophet of the Most High. Of course, that was such a controversy later on in his life where, when, when it came time to, you know, they really didn't like John the Baptist. The Pharisees didn't, but, but the Pharisees had to honor that the people thought, you know, like, hey, if we just take this guy out, uh, we're going to have a problem with the people because the people think he's a prophet from, uh, of God, right? So he, and he was. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord, this is referring to Jesus, to prepare the way for him. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Right? John's message was a message constantly of repentance. A message of repentance. Before Jesus shows up on the scene. On the scene. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. I love it. This is another analogy of light going on here. And he says, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. What a great song, right? Don't sometimes you hear a song and go, I should have wrote those lyrics straight. Say, what, a, what a great, what a great uh, portion of scripture. What a great shine, uh, um, uh, song. And, and here's what it is. To shine on those living in darkness. Jesus came to bring light to a dark world and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. My notes went to sleep here. This is what Christmas is all about, isn't it? This is what Christmas is about. An eternal light at the end of our proverbial tunnel. That's Christmas. That's the hope of Christmas. An eternal light at the end of our proverbial tunnels. That's the hope of Christmas. And the good news of Christmas, of the the Christmas season, is that God came to earth to rescue the world from darkness, to shine a light on a dark world, and to illuminate the way. And it's good news. It's good news. The problem is with the news is that it reveals to us that we can't do it ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We talk a lot about in our starting point, which Bessie talked about a little bit earlier. We talk a lot about you, you know, creating life-giving environments for people, creating environments where people can come in and feel welcome, feel loved, feel accepted, feel all of those things. And one of the reasons why we find that so valuable as a church is because we know it inevitably at some point we're going to, we're, we're going to get to a point in the service that's offensive. Scripture says that the gospel is offensive. We're going to get to a point in the service where we tell people that they're a sinner and there's nothing they can do about it. You're a sinner and you can't save yourself. That's the challenge of the gospel is that I have to understand. I have to accept, be willing to accept the fact that there's nothing I can do for my own salvation. We can't be good enough. We can't work hard enough. We can't just be better enough. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus was enough. Jesus was enough that God became man and made his dwelling among us. I love the way that John starts the book of of John. Um, And in scripture, we find this a lot of times. People didn't know what to name their books, so they just named it after themselves. And so so John writes this great book. He calls it John. And then he writes three more, and he calls it 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. I I don't know. He didn't seem like a real creative dude. But so John writes this book, John. And he starts out by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he's referring to Jesus coming to earth. 
He's referring to Jesus coming to earth. He's referring to, he said, listen, there, there is this element of who God is. There's this element of what was happening in heaven that God would come down to be his own creation, to live as a man. And then you skip to verse 14, and, and it's in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Jesus becoming a man. The, the, um, the Greek word there for, for Word is this Greek word called logos. Such a neat word. There's two words, I believe, in the Greek for uh, uh, logos and ramos, and, and, and logos being this, uh, this written, established kind of word, ramos being, ramos being this kind of like present and, and active word. Logos is where we get our English word logic, which I love that word picture. John's writing that it, the most logical way for you to live is to live like Jesus. The most logical way for us to live in the beginning was this logos. He becomes flesh and dwells among us. That's who Jesus was. He was the logic of heaven. The best possible solution. And people ask me all the time, especially when I'm out and about, and they find out that, that I, what I do for, you know, that I'm a pastor or whatever. They ask me all the time. Or, or more, better yet, they give me their opinion all the time. Do you really think that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Do you really think, like, like you know, like all the other religions in the world, all the other, you know, and then don't you just think that if you're a good person or if you're this or you're that or whatever, do you really think there's other ways to get to heaven? And I try to nod as long as I possibly can to end the conversation, to not get into some massive theological debate where at the end I have to tell them, their eternal destination. <laughs> because we're in a drive through and it's inappropriate, right? Like, it's just not the time, man. The line is getting bigger behind me. <laughs> Do you really think that Jesus is, yes. Yes. In fact, I think it's an insult to God, the Father, to, to, to try to place on him another, uh, other ways to get to him. To try to place on him other ways to get to him. Because heaven made the most perfect way the first time when he sent Jesus. Heaven made the most perfect way for restoration between man and God the first time with Jesus. And it wasn't just kind of this light thing that he's, oh, I'm going to make a way. No, it bankrupt heaven for Jesus to come to earth and live as a man and, and to live a perfect and sinless life and to die on a cross and to be the, the, the lamb of heaven, be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And Jesus being both our great high priest and our sacrificial lamb would pay the penalty once for for all it's perfect god doesn't need another way he made it perfect the first time jesus is heaven's perfect solution for our sin problem it's only jesus it's only ever been jesus since calvary and I would even argue since Big Day. It's always only been Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus brings light. Jesus brings light, number one, to, to our today. Jesus brings light to our today. This is good news. Jesus brings light to every problem that we find ourselves in, every solution that we need in this moment, every area of our life where there's, there's a struggle or, or maybe there's an addiction or there, there's a challenge or there's relational issues or there's financial issues. Jesus, the light of the world has come to shed light on everything that you need today. Jesus brings light to our tomorrow. Scripture talks about that, that we get to have a hope and a future. Prophet Jeremiah says we get to have a hope 
and a future. Jesus came that we may have light in our future, in all of our tomorrows. Everything that you're worried about in this season, Jesus has come for. Everything that, that you're concerned about, all of, uh, and you know, your career path and your, your mortgage and, and, and your retirement plan and, and all the different things that we allow to worry us. And you know, it's a crazy world to be raising kids or having grandkids or whatever. Uh, my mom tells me about how crazy the world is and how concerned she is for her grandparents, their grandchildren all the time. And I'm just like, mom, like, I can't keep having these conversations. I just want to get off the phone and like, you know, ever talk to anyone ever again like I can't but Jesus Jesus gives us light for our future for our tomorrows for all of our tomorrows he holds our our past and he holds our future he holds time he holds the whole thing in his hands number three Jesus brings light to our forever to our eternity we can know for sure we can have assurance that when we leave this life and enter into the realm of eternity, when we leave this life and enter into what, we, what sometimes we may call the afterlife or whatever, th that we can know for sure that we will not spend eternity outside of the presence of God, that, but we can spend eternity in the presence of God. The exact place we were created and designed to spend Jesus brings light to our forever. A lot of times we don't talk about hell or whatever as a church. And I, I even sometimes struggle theologically with, with I, I, don't get me wrong, I believe there is a real hell. I'm not, I'm not in any way saying that there's not. But even, even just narrowing down the, the exact theology on what that might look like or what that is, that, that that's ch has been challenging for me personally. But, but here's the devastation of hell to me is not how terrible it might be. The devastation of hell is that we had the opportunity to spend eternity in the presence of an almighty God and instead we spend it separated. Never once giving to live up to our full destiny of living in his presence. verse earlier we, we quoted John 1 and 14 John chapter 1 verse 1 and 14 here's this great verse kind of halfway between this is John talking about Jesus and he says the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world coming into the world the true light gives light to everyone is coming into the world. The most humble, the most, kind of, I don't know of another, the most like, poor <laughs> beginnings that a person is born in an animal trough. The God of the universe I think it's Hebrews who talks about that Jesus laid all of his godly attributes aside. He was still God, but he laid all of those things aside to be born as a man, to live as a man, to bring light and hope to a lost, dying, and dark world. Light has come. With every head bowed, I close and you're here this morning and you say you say you know what I, I want to meet this light I want the light of God to shine on my life I want to know Jesus you may be a great person you may live a good life by everybody's standards or whatever the problem with the gospel is it doesn't matter how good you are, you can't be good enough. You need a Savior.
someone who will pay the penalty for your sin and exchange for you all of the righteousness and perfection of Jesus Christ. And so you can live with a relationship with God the Father. He lovingly made a way for that to be possible because he loves you and he cares about you and he wants to know you.